Amen. Would you turn to 281? 281. Let's uh, sing what the choir just sang. Jesus saved. Let's all stand together as we sing. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves. On that first together. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saved. Jesus saved. Bear the news to every land. Climb the seas and cross the waves. Onward to singing this morning. Good to see you in church today. How many are glad Jesus saves? Amen. Amen. And I uh, hope you've experienced that. And if you haven't, you have opportunity to experience that this morning. Amen. And uh, looking forward to a good service together today. Thanks for being here. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in prayer. We thank you for another Lord's Day that you brought us to and for the uh, wonderful warm weather we're enjoying. And Lord, we're thankful for each one that's made their way out here to the service this morning. And Father, we bow before you here at the beginning of the service to first thank you for being our God. Thank you for the wonderful news that Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Father, thank you for the privilege to gather together here this morning in freedom we still enjoy in our country. And Father, we bow and ask you to speak to our hearts now today. We don't just want to go through the ritual of saying we went to church this morning. Lord, we want you to meet with us and speak to our hearts. And give each individual what they need today. So, Lord, use the music. Use our fellowship together. Honor the preaching of the word of God to accomplish your will in each one of our lives, please. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. 268. Turn with me, if you would, to number 268. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. Two, six, eight, on that first together. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood he purchased me. I will sing of my Redeemer and his heavenly love to me. He from death to life hath brought me, Son of God, with him to be. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me on the cross.
right, good singing this morning. Now some announcements for us. Uh, regular schedule today. Uh, we'll meet at 5.30 for the Christian growth class. And uh, our lesson tonight is going to be on soul winning. Uh, say, what in the world is soul winning? That's for learning how to witness to somebody else and bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, every Christian ought to know how to lead someone else to faith in Jesus Christ. Um, you don't do the saving, but you lead them to the one who can save them. And you ought to be able to take your Bible and show somebody how to do that. And we'll give you some tools and some ways that you can make that happen uh, in our class this evening. So uh, that's open for everyone. 5.30 down in the conference room right across from the nursery. Then 6.30 tonight back here for our evening service. And uh, I'm going to preach tonight on the subject, I am blessed. I am blessed. And by the way, you are too. And uh, we'll talk about that this evening at 6.30 in the evening service. All right? And uh, remember, uh, February uh, is I Love My Church Month, and that's always an exciting time. Uh, we'll kick that off on Wednesday night uh, with our service, and uh, next Sunday with I Love My Bible Sunday, and we'll have messages centered around that, but I uh, want you to bring in the folders if you need a few more. There are still some available. Uh, fill those up. I already had several children bring them to me, and they've got them all filled up and uh, looking for more. And uh, that's a great thing. So uh, fill those up. You get a get one of them filled up. That's uh, five New Testaments and two whole Bibles, or two whole Bibles. And so uh, let's let's fill as many of these as we can and bring them in next week to uh, collect. And we'll send it down to BPS for them to print Bibles for missionaries. Amen. Amen. It'll be great. You can imagine. You know, you can't imagine. I can't imagine standing up here if I had a Bible, and none of you did. Imagine you stand up and say, turn to such and such, and you just look at me. You know what I mean? You just, what, what you're doing, though, is you're, you're placing all your confidence in me, that I'm telling you the truth. Now, uh, the, the truth of the matter is, the great thing about the, having the Bible is, the pastor's not your authority. Amen. The Bible is your authority. Amen. And whenever the pastor says, you have a book to check it out yes, and right. make sure that uh, what he's saying is lining up with the Word of God. Uh, and the thing is, if God, if, if the missionary is the only one who has the Bible, then when the missionary goes, now what do they have? Yeah. Of anything. When Paul left the people in Acts, he said, I commend you unto the, the Lord and to the word of his grace. He said, I'm commending you unto God's word. That's what's going to keep you, and that's what's going to help you, and that's what's going to nourish you and keep you going. So the Bible is vital, and uh, there are many, many missionaries that are, uh, longing to, to have Bibles to give to folks and uh, to put them in the hands of people. So uh, let's let's help get that done, all right? That'll be next Sunday. Uh, we'll collect these back in. If you need them, they're on the table back there. Uh, pick one up and uh, grab it and start filling it up and bring it in next Sunday, okay? All right, we'll take a minute. Anybody visiting this morning? We'd like to welcome any guests we have today. Anybody here today for the first time? Would you put your hand up? I'm looking around. I don't think see anybody for the first time. Just the home folk here on the last Sunday of January. And uh, let's hear from our choir. Wonderful, wonderful. 
to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, not a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. Not a grief nor a loss, not a frown or a cross, but it blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and And let's dismiss the children to junior church. We'll sing that last together. On that last, then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he said we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey. singing this morning. Let's go to 298, 298. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Let's all stand together one more time as we sing 298. On that first. <clears throat> Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
<laughs> Maybe not today. <laughs> now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Let's sing that last all together. When we get to the chorus, we're going to have uh, uh, the instruments drop out, and we'll sing that chorus a cappella. Let's sing that last together. Joy flood my soul, for Jesus has saved me. On that last, joy flood my soul, for Jesus has saved me. Freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Amen. All right, good singing. You can be seated. Have the ushers come and get our offering now this morning. Give us the Lord as blessed and prospered you. Appreciate your faithfulness in giving. And uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our offering. Now this morning, I'll ask Brother Don Taylor to lead us in our prayer, please. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, we do thank you for this great day that you've made. Again, a place to worship. Just even being born here in America. Lord, help our country open up the eyes of those that are blind, and bring them back to you, Lord. Father, we ask that you bless this offering and multiply it as only you can. May it be pleasing to you. May each each give as they should, Lord, with a cheerful heart. Be with the pastor as he opens up the word. We thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading. Do 2 Kings chapter 4, please. 2 Kings chapter 4. Second Kings 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 7. We'll read them responsibly, so normally do together on verse 1, then I'll read 2 and alternate till we end together on verse 7 of 2 Kings chapter 4. And as our custom is, let's stand together, read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 4. Ready? Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, 
What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all those vessels, and shalt set, shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture uh, here this morning. I pray, God, that you would prepare our hearts and we'd be ready to receive the truth you have for us today. Lord, I pray that there are many things I know that could occupy our minds and distract us this morning from hearing from the still small voice of the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us uh, as we listen to the special this morning that precedes the message that you would use it to tune our hearts to yours and to focus our attention on the Word of God. And so, Lord, prepare us and prepare to speak to us today as only you can. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was drifting away on life's pitiless sea, and the angry waves threaten my ruin to be. When away at my side there I dimly descried a stately old vessel, and loudly I cried. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, and loudly I cried, ship ahoy. T'was the old ship of Zion, the sailing along, all aboard her seemed joyous. I heard their sweet song, and the captain's kind ear, ever ready to hear, caught my wail of distress as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy, ship ahoy, as I cried out in fear. Ship ahoy. The good captain commanded a boat to be lord, and with tender compassion he took me on board. And I'm happy today, all my sins washed away in the blood of my Savior. And now I can say, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. From my soul I can say, bless the Lord. Oh, soul sinking down, and he sends merciless waves. The strong arm of our captain is mighty to save. Then trust him today, no longer delay. Board that old ship of Zion and shout on your way. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, shout. 
out and sing on your way. Jesus saves. Amen. Amen. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer and we want to thank you for the old ship of Zion, the wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we started the songs today with Jesus Saves, and it's kind of fitting we ended with the special of Jesus Saves. And Lord, we're thankful that we have a Savior. We're thankful that Jesus is our Savior. And Father, I pray that you will minister to our hearts now this morning. I pray that you'll help me as I bring this truth today. And please help the folks as they listen. Lord, help us to grasp what the truth is and understand what you desire to do in each one of our lives. And I pray you'd use it to be a help and an encouragement to the people of God that are here this morning. So have your way in every heart and life, please. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Back in 2 Kings chapter 4, if your Bibles are still open there. And I hope, I hope you have your Bible. I, I know we're in an electronic age and people bring their phones to church. And it's just something about having a relationship with a book. Uh, God gave us a book. And there's just something about that. It's, if you want to mark a verse or highlight a verse or underline a verse or circle a word or write a note, it's a little tough to do that on your phone or on your tablet. Uh, it's just something about the book. Um, there's, uh, there's not much to distract you when you're looking in this, but there is a whole lot to distract you when you're looking on your phone. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Thank you. As usual, if I have to do the preaching and the amen, and we'll be here twice as long. So I'll do the preaching and you do the amen, and, all right? Here's a woman in 2 Kings chapter 4 that we don't know anything about her life except these seven verses. And it doesn't tell us a whole lot about her at that point except she was married to a prophet, uh, someone who served Elisha and was uh, maybe one of the school of the prophets there. Maybe he was going to Bible college. I don't know. Uh, it doesn't say a lot about that. But all we know is he's died. And that's a difficult situation any time but it was especially difficult in those days uh, woman women did not work and she had no way to take care of herself she did have two sons and they could work and try to support her however uh, they were managing with that and going along with that and uh, then she discovered that her husband had some debt some creditors that he owed money to and there was nothing she could do about that. A debt that, I mean, they were, they were barely getting by. I, I could picture her and her sons just kind of eking out the existence. And then all of a sudden the creditor comes and says, here's what you owe. Here's what you need to pay us. And if you don't, we're coming to take your sons. They'll go to debtor's prison until they pay it off. Well, the last thing she needed, if her sons go away, she's got no way to support herself. She's got no way to take care of herself. So she goes to Elisha. She goes, what am I supposed to do? And, and tell me what I'm, what I'm supposed to, how I'm supposed to handle this. In other words, here, hey, I've been handling things all along, but now I've got something I don't know how to handle. I have something I don't know what to do about. You ever felt like you're handling life? You ever felt like you're handling your, as, as what we call life and the, the, the things that go along with it and all of a sudden something comes up and, and something arises and something knocks on your door and you say, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. I don't know how I'm going to handle this. What, 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 what am I supposed to do now? I don't see any way possible to take care of this. And I'm going to talk to you this morning about what are you going to do or why does God rock your boat you're in the boat and you're sailing through life and everything's going well and all of a sudden God decides I'm going to rock your boat a little bit I'm going to send you into a storm I'm going to send some rough times your way now what are you going to do and, and how are you going to handle this here she is in a bad situation I think life was 
moving along as well as she could and, and as well as it could with her husband and two sons and Bible college and training to be a prophet of God and then he suddenly dies apparently here in the story and, and, and she's hardly able to eke out an existence and now she finds out that she owes a big debt that she can't pay. Hey, what would you do if you got a letter today for, or tomorrow in the mail from the IRS and says, by the way, you owe us $50,000? Unless you're Bob Wallace, you'd be worried about that. <laughs> and Kay, Kay Wallace says, you better tell me about that. Huh? Yeah. She says, Where, where's he got that money? No, you know what I mean? That, that, for most of us, they say, man, what am I going to do about that? What are we going to do about something like that? Or maybe it's $100,000. So, say, well, what? And by the way, if we just tried to pay off, the, by the way, everybody here in this room, every adult in this room, you're, you're $80,000 in debt to the government anyway. We, if you spread out that national debt we owe, 80, if you're married, it's $160,000 for your household right now. Every single American, I think over uh, 18 years of age, would have to pay $80,000 to get us back to even. And that's growing by the minute. You say, man, we'll never get that paid. Now you're getting the picture. Now you're getting the picture. That's where she was. You ever, you ever had your world turned upside down? Hmm? And you just don't know what you're going to do? And you're not quite sure what God's up to? Can I, can I help you with something? If you're not, everybody in the room today, you're either, and I, and I know this probably isn't the most encouraging statement you're ever going to hear in your life, but it's reality. You're, you're either in a storm this morning you're coming out of a storm or you're getting ready to head into one just the way it is don't ever look at someone else's life and say man I wish I had their life boy they're just they're just sailing right along you have no idea what's going on in their life you have no idea what what God may be doing to rock their boat and what God does to rock your boat. You see, you don't really have to worry about anybody else's boat. You've got your own boat you're in. And your own storm to deal with. And sometimes when things happen to people and they tend to, to come in bunches, what happens is sometimes we get to thinking, and be careful, because sometimes we say, well, God, what are you doing to me? God, what, what, what is happening to me? Why are you doing this to me? And, and at the root of that sometimes is that, God, I deserve better than this. And, and can I just settle that at the beginning of the message? We don't deserve better. What we deserve as sinners against God is we deserve to die and go to hell. Anything above that is God's grace. God's grace. Why? Hey. Why does God rock your boat? Why does God send the storm? Why troubles? Why tragedies? Why sometimes death of loved ones and friends? Prematurely, we look at it. Why financial struggles? Why broken relationships? Let me give you, let me give you three simple reasons why I believe God will rock your boat this morning. Number one, God will do it to show us that we need Him. God will do it to show us that we need Him. You see, we're, don't, don't, you don't need to ever say to anybody, well, I just struggle with pride. Because that's the human nature. Everybody's proud. Everybody has to die to pride. The middle letter of pride is I. And all of us have an I problem, not just Brother Moreland. Okay? All of us have an I problem. And we get to thinking, once things are going along pretty good, you know what we think? I can, I can handle this on my own. Especially if we come up with a problem and we take care of it and there's another situation and we can handle it. We get to thinking, well, I can, handle, I can handle things pretty good. I can do this on my own. 
I think that this widow woman thought, well, I've handled it so far since my husband died. I'm trying to keep these two boys in line. They seem to be doing all right. We're taking care of things. We're, we're keeping food on the table. And we're trying to keep the home up. But now, God brought something up to her that she cannot handle. God brought something up to her to show her, you can't do this on your own. You need me. And God is going to rock your boat at times to show you that you need Him. Something big that you don't have a solution for. I'm talking to people this morning. You know how to handle problems with the boss. You know how to handle problems with co-workers at work. You've learned how to work with people. You learn how to word things to, to, to calm people down and to get people to, to work with each other. You, you, you've done it often enough that you've become confident in your abilities. That you can handle things. And pretty soon you get to thinking you can handle it all. The Titanic, which of course hit an iceberg that ripped a 300 foot gash in the side of it. And there was no way to fix it or repair it. What you may not know is that the designer of the Titanic was on the ship. He's the one who proclaimed that even God couldn't sink this ship. They called him to the captain's quarters when the, they hit the iceberg and the gash was discovered. And they asked him, what do you think? You know what he said? He said, she's dead. They said, wait a minute. You said that this is unsinkable. He said, I designed this ship that five of the first six compartments could take on water and she would still stay afloat. But you're telling me that all six compartments have water in them. He said, she's dead. She's going down. And you know who went down with the ship? The guy who said it couldn't be sunk. He went down with the ship. You know what he found out? That even he couldn't handle everything. Even he couldn't handle everything. Sometimes you're going to have trouble and you'll call mom and dad if they're still around. And some of you parents understand something. By the way, you understand parents, you never stop being a parent. You know, I know kids sometimes, hey, wait till I'm 18 and I get out of here. And then in your mind, parent, you're saying, me either. <laughs> but you find out that, that even when they're out, you're still parent to them. You're still dad. You're still mom. And especially when they get in some trouble, you're going to hear from them. Sometimes they call mom and dad, and mom and dad try to help them. But you know what? This God's going to bring you to some things where mom and dad can't even help you. Mom and dad can't get you out of it. Where other people can't help you. Other people can't solve the problem. It's only going to be God. When God begins to rock your boat, when God begins to bring the storm into your life, He's the only one that can help you. He's the only one. It's bigger than mom. It's bigger than dad. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. When the prodigal son had wasted it all and, and he sat in that pig farm and looking at the husk the pigs ate and by the way nobody gave to him he realized nobody can help me but my father there's going to be a time when God's going to put you in such a situation and maybe some of your own doing but he'll let you go until you say nobody can help me but God and you're right and you're right but God will bring those situations into our lives to teach us that we need him Daniel God rocked his boat Daniel's uh, uh, moved up in the regime of Babylon and later in the regime of Persia and he's he's one of the three presidents of the whole thing and 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 by the way we, you get to Daniel chapter 6 and you read about Daniel in the lion's den I want you to understand Daniel's 90 years old He's not, he's not some 23-year-old down in the lion's den thinking, I can whip a lion anyway. He's 90. 
He's, he's, he's Brother Ray's age. I'm teasing. This is Ray back here, yeah. You better laugh, Ray, all right? Thank you. Actually, Ray's 100, but um, no, I'm kidding. I'm teasing. But he's, he's not a young man. But wait a minute, hey, everything's going on good. Hey, I've moved up in the kingdom. I'm one of the three presidents. Life is good. Until they pass the law that nobody's going to pray to anybody but the king. And the king has sealed it. Can Daniel do anything about that? Can the king do anything about it? No. It's a done deal. So he, he has to face the lines. Listen, he's in a situation where nobody can do anything about his situation but God. And you, you, you just look at your Bible sometime and you'll find that God places people in different situations to where no one can help them but God. Because He's showing them that they need Him. By the way, God came through in that, didn't He? By the way, that's how... That's why it's difficult. Most of you, listen, most of you who got saved in this room, you got saved because God was rocking your boat. You know why it's hard to go down into some of these neighborhoods in Grove City where they have, you know, 500,000, 700,000 million dollar homes and go knock on their door and tell them, tell them how badly they need Jesus? And by the way, they do. But they're looking around and saying, hey, wait a minute, i got a four-car garage, I've got a motor home, I've got this beautiful house, I've got a vacation home somewhere else. Life's pretty sweet for me. What do I need Jesus for again? But I'll tell you what happens. The financial markets go down or the pink slip comes at work or they get a child that goes to the hospital and hanging in the balance, life or death. You know what happens? God rocks that boat. And then they say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to listen. I'm ready to listen. That's how most people come to know Christ. You didn't come to know Christ when everything was going great in your life. You came to know Christ when God was, was making it rough on you. And you knew, I better look to Him. There's got to be more something more than this. And you look to God, and you look to Christ, and you got saved. So God brings those, God rocks the boat, God brings the storms in our life to show us we need Him. Otherwise, we go without Him. Remember, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. That's how we go astray. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The problem is, when we get confident and we get things going good and we think we're doing it, we don't acknowledge him in any of our ways. We just got this. And from, from maybe from Sunday to Sunday or Sunday to Wednesday, we really don't give God a thought. We just live our life the way we want to live our life. There should not be any disconnect, my friend, from what you are on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night to what you are on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Don't make a disconnect between those two. Listen, you need Him and I need Him 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, in all thy ways acknowledge Him. So he shows us that we need him. Number two, the second reason I believe he brings storms in our life or he rocks our boat is to see how serious we are about living for him. To see how serious we are about living for him. Let me ask you a question. What would it take to get you to stop serving God? What would it take to get you to stop serving God? Wasn't that really Satan's question to Job? I mean to God about Job? Job served you for nothing, and, and you know he serves you because all the good stuff you've done for him. He was telling God, you take that stuff away, that's a slave ball translation, but you take those things away that you've done for him, and he'll curse you to your face. And God said, okay, you can, you can take it away. And buddy, he lost everything. 
You can't imagine. You can't imagine what Job went through. Basically, all of his livestock, all of his cattle, all of his business is gone. Then all ten children are killed. He has nothing left but his wife. And, and as she looks at him suffer and looks at the agony that he's going through, and by the way, in great agony herself, I cannot, my wife and I were talking the other morning, you know, I, I cannot imagine what it's like to lose a child. Some of you have been through that. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't understand. That. I, I can't begin to comprehend the pain that that would be and the, the empty place that's there always. Can you imagine losing 10? Now, don't understand. I, I understand from people who have lost a child. Don't, don't, don't. Sometimes people have five children and one passes away and somebody makes the, 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 the can I say stupid? All the kids are in children's church, right? Uh, comment that, well, you still have four others. Like, that's supposed to make this hurt less of losing one? That doesn't hurt less. But you understand, she went, she had, she had no, no children. None. All ten gone. And she finally looks at her husband and says, why don't you just curse God and die? After all, that's what the devil wanted, wanted him to do. That's what everybody, that's what the devil and probably everybody else thought he would do. But to their amazement, and maybe to her amazement, uh, maybe to Job's own amazement, you know what he said? The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job said, you think that's going to get me to stop serving God? No, that won't do it. And the devil came back and he said, hey, well, wait a minute. Uh, let's do this. Uh, skin for skin, a man will give everything for his own life. And, and he said, I'm going to touch his, his, his health. And God says, you can touch his health, but you can't take his life. And boy, he struck Job with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. And those were so miserable and, and he was in so much pain that he, he broke off a piece of pottery and he scraped it down his arm just to scrape those boils off and that felt good compared to the pain he was in. And yet, and yet Job, his testimony as he lay there in ashes and boils all over his body and miserable, you know what he said? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God, hey, 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 devil, I don't care if God takes my life. I'm serving Him until He takes my life. What would it take to get you to quit? Well, the pastor didn't shake my hand. Hmm? Oh, truth. Well, the song director told me I couldn't sing a lick. And, and people, by the way, people quit for all sorts of things. Petty things. Simple things. And, and I think sometimes I think, huh, that's all it took. That was easy. That was easy. What does it take to get you to quit serving God? Look and uh, hold your finger there in 2 Kings, but go to uh, New Testament to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Would you look there please? 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, God will rock our boat. God will bring the storm to us to show us that we need Him, but He'll also do it to see how serious we are about serving Him. How serious are you about serving God? Paul said in verse number 23 of 2 Corinthians 11, Paul writes, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, 
in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Now, was this Paul's resignation letter? <laughs> no. He wrote over in the book of Acts, he says, none of these things move me. He says, I, I'm going to finish my course with joy in the ministry that I've received with the Lord Jesus. I wonder if that's the kind of Christian life that most American Christians have, whether they'd keep going or not. You say, well, that, if that's what serving God does, forget it. If that's what I get for serving the Lord, man, count me out. What's it take to stop you? Maybe you, you know, it's interesting. In another place, Paul writes about how they've been knocked down, but not knocked out. Persecuted, but not forsaken. And he, he, he hey, you've been knocked down? And, and maybe it's sin. Maybe it's disappointment in somebody else. Maybe it's the death of a parent or the death of a child. I remember reading that there were two evangelists back in the 1940s that the Southern Baptist Convention wanted to really get behind and promote. And, and actually there was one that they really wanted to back and make him the national evangelist, so to speak. And this fella ended up turning away from God and actually became what he called a self-proclaimed atheist and didn't even believe there was a God. Say, so what turned him around like that? What, what turned him away from preaching? What turned him away from being an evangelist? When, when, by the way, the one they chose to take his place was a man named Billy Graham. And they put their weight behind him. And by the way, when you hear Billy Graham preaching in the 1940s and in the early 50s, it's not the same Billy Graham you hear in the 80s and 90s. He was a fireball, hellfire and brimstone preacher. And, and, and this fella, they said, was better than he was. You know what happened? That fella named Templeton, his parents were killed in a car crash. And he got mad and bitter at God about his parents being taken in a car crash. And he turned away from God. What would it take for you to quit serving God? Sometimes the, 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 the simplest things and, and sometimes things that they get tough and you know what? People just drop out. Satan's going to keep probing and he's going to keep looking for that weakness. He's going to keep trying to see just just testing, how serious are you about this serving God business? We have the prisoners in the prison and, you know, they, they go through the RU program and often they want us to contact relatives. And the relatives, while, while they can express some optimism that they're in a program, they also are very skeptical. It's jailhouse religion. Let's see how they are when they get out. Let's see if it's real. Let's see, if, let's see how serious they really are about this when they're not behind bars. Be careful. Sometimes those who boast the loudest are one of the first ones to give up. So how you know that's true? I read about a fellow in the Bible who was that way. I'm really, I'm really cautious, and we've seen it in RU, when somebody stands up to testify and talks about how great they're doing and how good they're doing. And I cringe when I hear that. Because there was somebody in the Bible who stood up, a fellow named Peter, who said, Lord, though everybody's going to forsake you, I'm not forsaking you, buddy. Bunch of wimps over there, but not me. Man, I'm, I'm going to be with you all the way. Yeah, how'd that boasting work out for you, Peter? 
He had a little girl come up and question him, and he couldn't even handle her. He'd been cursing and swearing again. He said, wait a minute, that's Peter? You know what? Peter, Peter quit. He wept bitterly. And, and Jesus tried to send him the signal when he told the women to come back from the, uh, those who had uh, seen him at the tomb. They said, you go tell the disciples and Peter that I'll meet him in Galilee. I'll guarantee you he did that for a purpose. If he'd have just said, go tell the disciples, Peter would have thought, he ain't talking to me. I'm a denier. I betrayed him. I'm no better than Judas. And I don't think Peter considered himself to even be an apostle, a disciple. And so he said, he mentioned his name on purpose. And then you know the story in John 21 when Jesus met him on the shore there after they fished all night. And Jesus looks at Simon Peter and he says, Simon, son of Jonas, what did he ask him? Lovest thou me more than these? I think you know what Jesus was saying? Peter, what's it going to take to stop you? Are you serious about serving me? Oh, you can speak boastful things. But are you serious? Are you serious about serving me? Feed my sheep. And he drilled it three times to, I think, equal the three denials. And Peter knew that he was going to meet business about serving God. You read 1st, 2nd Peter, and we're in 2nd Peter on Wednesday night. You read about how the, the, the suffering and the such that he talks about. When the tragedy comes, when the wind blows, when the boat is rocked, when the hurricane is struck, what are you going to do? Can I tell you what you should do? You should say, I'm getting dressed and I'm coming out on soul winning on Saturday. I'm getting dressed and I'm going to be in church Sunday morning. I'm getting dressed and I'm going to be in church Sunday night. I'm getting dressed I'm going to be in church Wednesday night. I'm getting up tomorrow morning, going to open my Bible, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going, to, I'm going to get on my face before God and I'm going to spend time in prayer. I'm going to keep doing what I know I ought to do. And keep doing what I know the Lord would want me to do. Why? Hey, if nothing else, I'm going to show God I'm serious about serving you. I'm not serving you just because everything's good. I'm not serving you because you've been good to me, though God's been good to all of us. I'm not serving you because of all you. He says, I'm, ser- I'm serious about serving you, and though you slay me, yet I will trust you. So God rocks our boat to show us our need of Him, to, to see how serious we are about living for Him. And then listen carefully. Now, the third reason I think God sends us, rocks our boat and sends us the storms is that number three, He wants to break our will. Did you know God often will have to use pain to bring about changes in our life? How many people have you known that have that have struggled with smoking until the doctor says You have lung cancer. You better quit right now. And they quit. You have a, or they have a heart attack. Bam, they quit. Pain has a wonderful way of having us make changes in our life. We always pray, God, take the pain away. I don't want any pain in my life. And God says, I got a purpose for that pain. How about asking me to accomplish the purpose for which I gave you the pain? You see, if he took away the hurt, we wouldn't make any changes. You know, a child, a child learns, don't they? 
when they touch that stove and it's hot? Hot. They only have to touch it once till they learn, I don't want to touch that. Pain teaches them something, does it not? What happens occasionally, you'll read about someone who doesn't feel pain. That's a very serious condition. Because they could seriously hurt themselves and not know it. Seriously burn or break a, break a, break a bone and they don't feel any pain. There are people like that. There are some things God wants to teach us that He can only teach us through pain. We'll not learn it any other way. The greatest, you know, the greatest enemy you have in serving God is not the devil. It's the person you got up and looked in the mirror this morning. That's the biggest enemy we got. That's the person we have the roughest time with. Oh, I know sometimes we're, we're quick to give the devil a lot of credit when the devil had nothing to do with it. It's us. It was our flesh. It was just our, 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 our stubborn will. And that's always the problem, is our will. You know one of the biggest things that a Christian ever learns to do is to do what God tells them to do? What, why? Why won't some people get saved? Yeah. Bottom line, they don't want to. I will not. Jesus looked at a group of people one day. He says, you will not come to me that you might have life. When you ever witnessed anybody give a plan of salvation, I always ask them, now are you willing to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And it's either yes, I'm willing, or no, I'm not. There's no middle ground. And by the way, if somebody says, well, I'll think about it, that means, no, I'm not willing. It's our will. Now, our biggest problem, not only is that a problem with salvation, but wait a minute, those of us who yield to Him for salvation, then it becomes a problem now that we're saved. Are you telling me that every time since you've been saved that God prompted you to do something or you read something in His Word that you said, yes, Lord, and you did it? Ah, so we still have a problem with our will, don't we? God still has to break our will. We resist His will or sometimes we just flat ignore His will altogether. So God will bring a storm. God will rock our boat. Because He wants to break our will. God's getting us to bring us to a point to where we'll say, not my will, but thine be done. You know, that's what goes on when you have children. Charles and Shauna are here today. Back here, they come to our U program on Friday night. They have a, how old's your little girl? How old is your little girl? The one that Charles had down here Friday night? Two years old. The terrific twos. And she's at that age, and all babies go through it, where they, they, she wants to cry and throw a fit when it's time to go to the nursery. Now, Mrs. Barham was in there. Maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. But I, <laughs> I'm only serious. Don't take me kidding. Like, no, I'm kidding. I had to make sure she was awake and listening, okay? You're listening? All right. Can't now. You got to do worse than that to get out of the nursery. So. But she's at that age, and kids go through that. But I was talking to Charles and Shauna, and I said, listen, here's, here's what you got to do. I said, you got to put her in that nursery. She'll scream. She'll cry. But right now, she's training you. She's just taught you that if she'll cry and fuss, She'll get to sit with dad all night. And dad will hold her in his lap. And she'll get to spend time with him. And she just trained you. I said, are you going to train her and say, no, you're going to the nursery because we have class. And, and to their credit, they took the advice. And they put her in. And guess what? She, they're here today, and I suppose she is. She must have lived through it. Huh? 
But you see, you're, you're, and by the way, you do that. You tell your child to, you, you stand in there and you say, come here, and they run the other way. You better go get them and give them a proper spanking and then sit them in the same place and say, come here. And if they don't come here, you go get them and you discipline them again and you set them there and you bring, you know why? It's a battle of the wills, isn't it? Whose will is going to win out? Your will or their will? Now, some of you with small children, you know. You, you got a battle on your hands with some of those kids. But whose will is going to win out? Hey, we've got far too many homes in America where the child's will is ruling the home, not mom and dad's will. But wait a minute. We probably have far too many Christians that their will is ruling in their life instead of God's will. You can have a battle of the wills with God, but I'll guarantee you God's going to win. God is going to win. God will break your will. He's able to break your will. You get saved because you surrender your will. I, I am called to the ministry because I surrendered my will. Went to Bible college because I surrendered my will. Prepared for the ministry because I surrendered my will. What is it that God's asking you to do and you won't surrender because of your stubborn will? What is it? You really think you can hold your will out against God's? Ask Jonah how that works out. God will win. Is God rocking your boat this morning? Are you in the midst of a storm? Are you aware that God may be just showing you that you need Him? God may be showing you that He's, he's finding out if you're serious about really serving Him. Is God trying to break your will? To where you bow the knee and say, not my will, but thine be done. A man, had, a, a, a missionary, pastor met him one day and he said, uh, he met him and the fellow introduced him. He was a missionary on a deputation to go to Japan. And the missionary, and the pastor was asking him about it. He said, well, tell me your story. He said, well, he said, I was in church one day, and I, my family hadn't gone to church, but somebody invited me to go to church and heard a message on salvation and Christ being the Savior, and I surrendered to his will, and I got saved that day. He said, and then it wasn't long after that, God dealt my heart about serving him, and I went forward and surrendered to serve him with my life. Whatever he wanted me to do, be a preacher or whatever. And that's when someone told me about Bible college and I should go get training at Bible college. And by the way, let me, let me help you understand something. Bible college does not educate you. It, it begins to prepare you for ministry. But it doesn't... It doesn't you really learn about the ministry once you're in the ministry. I can, I can give you things this long that, they never, that I've run into in the ministry that I never heard a thing about in Bible college. <laughs> and, but he said, I surrendered. And I went to Bible college. And that's where this particular pastor had met him. And he said, well then, then you surrendered and to be a missionary in Japan. He said, no, I didn't. He said, I heard a message one day and the preacher preached about surrendering to be a missionary in Japan and God spoke to my heart that that's what he wanted me to do and I said, Lord, I don't want to go to Japan. That's a whole different culture. They speak a different language. And I don't want to take my wife and my children over to another country and have them live like that. I won't go. But he said, you're, you told me you're on 
deputation to go to Japan. He said, that's right. He said, I'm driving with my family. And I drove into the side of a train. He said, the train didn't hit me. I hit the train. And it drug our family 250 feet down the tracks. And I heard my wife and my children scream. The metal going down the tracks. Then he said, I watched as those paramedics picked up the lifeless body of my two-year-old son and laid him on the hood of the car and say he's dead. And I dropped to my knees and said, God, I'll go to Japan. I'll go to Japan. Do you really want to get into a battle of wills with God? Why don't you surrender your will to Him? Do what God's asking you to do. That's why God sometimes rocks our boat. He's showing us we need Him. He's seeing if we're serious about serving Him. And he wants to break our will so that we'll submit our will to his will. That's why God rocks your boat. Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for the attention of everyone today. And Lord, thank you for being willing to rock our boat, that we would recognize our need of you. That we would realize that there needs to be a consecration and a dedication to serving you. That our will needs to surrender to your will. And Father, I pray that those in this room that are you're rocking their boat today, that they would look at these areas and say, is which one of these or which of these or how many of these is God trying to get me to do? And I pray you'd use the message. And Lord, if there's any in the room today that has never surrendered their will to your will in the matter of salvation and trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray they'd trust Him today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'll finish the prayer in just a moment. But I wonder how many folks here this morning can say, Preacher, I, I know for sure that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I know that Jesus is my Savior. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it? I know that He's my Savior. I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put them down. Is there somebody here today who would say, Pastor, I don't know for sure if I'm saved. I don't know for sure that Christ is my Savior. I've never surrendered my will to His. Would you pray for me? Would you slip your hand up and then put it back down that I'll see it? I think I saw everybody's hand go up. The message was to believers this morning. I wonder how many believers here today would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart today. God's, God's rocking our boat. I'm going to ask Him what He wants us to do. Maybe it's your will. Maybe it's He's seeing how serious you are about serving Him. Maybe it's just... Him showing you you can't do it on your own. You need me. But whatever it is, if God has dealt with your heart today, would you say, Pastor, pray for me today? God dealt with my heart. Would you slip it up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. God has spoken to your heart. The time to deal with Him is come to the altar. Bow the knee. Surrender your will to His will. You'll never regret surrendering your life to God. You'll never regret submitting your will to His will. Heavenly Father, bless this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to hearts. May Your will be done in every heart and life, Lord, in this invitation time. Hear the prayers of Your people as we bow the knee before You. Lord, may holy decisions be made for thee this morning. Make us vessels for the final. Make us...
people that would live their lives to honor and glorify you. Help us to live our lives depending on you. Recognizing our need of you each and every day. Help us to show others and to show you how serious we are about living our life for you. No matter what comes. And Father, may our our life reflect that we have a submitted will to your will. So, Lord, please, help each one to do what you're telling them to do in their heart. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, our pianist will play. As she plays, Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart this morning. You can respond to him today, will you? That's right. That's right. All to him I freely give. I will live love and trust him. In his presence daily live, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus, I surrender. At his feet I bow, worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. I surrender, make me Savior, holy thine. Let me feel the Holy Spirit, truly know that thou art mine. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Thee. Fill me with Thy love and power. Let Thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. Savior, I surrender And be seated for a minute, if you would, please. Thank you. We're glad to have Xavier and Felicia coming this morning. Xavier and Felicia Perrick, and uh, of course, they've been members here, I think, since September. Does that sound right? Or was it? Yeah. And uh, they uh, are surrendering their lives to go to the mission field. Isn't that great? And uh, give my hand. That's wonderful. Um, 
God's been doing wonderful things in in their art. Now they're not leaving tomorrow or anything. Uh, it's a it's a it's a goal, and it's something that they they just wanted to make public that they're surrendering to do what God wants them to do, and uh, lead wherever God leads them to go. Uh, they have a surrendered will to what God wants, and uh, this is just to get their church to pray for them, to continue to encourage them, and really to help them to stay accountable as well, that they'll not get sidetracked, and uh, that you know, Satan loves to, to get in and get you looking elsewhere, and um, it's, a, it's a battle sometimes, especially when you have family that does not understand uh, why you would not want to stay in America and uh, why you would go to some other country. So uh, please pray for them and uh, pray for God to just lead their every step and uh, that he will direct their path. Uh, they'll acknowledge him in all their ways and he will direct their path. And uh, But I, I appreciate these two and their heart for, for the Lord and their desire to serve him. And uh, they have uh, just jumped in serving the Lord uh, here. And uh, that's who God... Hey. When God called the first two missionaries, they were serving in the local church. And that's who God calls. God calls people who are already serving him and uh, busy doing what they, what they know they should do. And then God directs them to another place. And uh, we're excited about that, excited about what the Lord's going to do in your life. Amen? Amen. And uh, that's great. Congratulations to you. We'll have them come to the back so you can uh, greet them and congratulate them and assure them on your prayers. And I think... Uh, for now, get with Brother Moreland and make sure he makes a prayer card up for you that we can use just here at church. You know what I mean? doesn't have to have a country on it if you don't know exactly where you're going. Uh, he's looking at some areas up in Russia, um, so that's a possibility. But just, just a prayer card just so you can have it and uh, pray for him and uh, be faithful to pray for him. It's a good reminder uh, to remember to pray for them on a daily basis. All right? Okay, let's stand together. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us and for decisions made for you today. God, thank you for being a God that is involved in our lives. You desire to work in each one of our hearts and lives that we'd bring honor and glory to you and that we would conform to the image of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for Xavier and Felicia, and Lord, may your hand be upon them. And may you, as I prayed earlier, clear any obstacles in the way that would keep them from going to the field, Lord, and things that uh, look impossible to us or look difficult to us. We know there's nothing too hard for God. And so, Lord, continue to lead them and guide them and use them uh, in a great way, both here and in the future, wherever you would lead them. Now, Father, dismiss us with your care. And Lord, give us a good afternoon. Bring us back safely for our service this evening. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Brother Bob. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heads with Jesus as we travel the sun. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you tonight.